This is KGW News at Noon. Welcome to the News at Noon. I'm Drew Carney, and we start today with a tragic story from Clark County over the weekend, where a sheriff's deputy mistakenly shot and killed an off-duty Vancouver police officer. KGW's Galen Etlin explains what exactly took place before the officer was shot. Southwest Washington mourns Vancouver police officer Donald Sahota. The 52-year-old was shot and killed in his battleground home Sunday by a Clark County deputy by accident. The Lower Columbia Major Crimes Team is investigating. It started here. Investigators say a man robbed a clerk at gunpoint, then took off in a stolen car. Authorities chased him north, and eventually the man ditched the car and went door to door trying to hide in a remote wooded area of battleground. LCMC says the man ended up outside Officer Sahota's home off of this road, and the two got into a fight. Sahota ended up with some stab wounds. The man then ran toward the house, and Sahota picked up his gun. That's when deputies arrived, and one fired several shots with a rifle, unknowingly hitting Officer Sahota and not the robbery suspect. Sahota died, and the unidentified suspect was taken into custody. Vancouver's mayor put out a statement saying, It will likely be days before we know more. I hope the community will hold Officer Sahota's family and our law enforcement community in our thoughts and hearts. Sahota served Vancouver PD since April 2014, and before that worked for Gresham and Port of Portland Police. Gresham PD put out a statement saying Sahota worked there for nearly 14 years and was a, quote, kind and thoughtful person, someone we will always remember for his tenacious work ethic and commitment to bringing justice to victims and their families. Sahota leaves behind a wife and two children. Galen Etlin, KGW News. Well, this morning we learned the name of the person deputies were chasing. According to jail records, Julio Segura was arrested. He suspected of robbing the convenience store. Galen just mentioned in that report. Deputies say Segura also stole and crashed a car, and they say he admitted to stabbing Officer Sahota. Police continue to investigate a deadly shoot, uh, shooting that happened over the weekend in Northeast Portland. Someone called 911 around 8.30 last night to report gunshots in the area of Northeast 52nd and Cooch. When officers arrived there, they found a man dead with multiple bullet wounds. There's no word yet on a suspect, but Portland police did say they've responded to almost 100 shootings since the beginning of January. We're going to talk about one more right here. Portland police also looking for information about a fatal shooting that happened over the weekend in the Hazelwood neighborhood. Officers were called to Southeast Stark near I-205 around 1:45 in the morning on Sunday. They found a person dead on Southeast Oak near 97th. We have no information on a suspect here either and no arrests have been made. Anyone with information is asked to contact Portland police. We now know the names of the two people who were killed in a plane crash in Salem over the weekend. Officers were called to the Salem Municipal Airport around 3 in the afternoon on Saturday. They found a plane that had crashed at the end of a runway. Witnesses say that plane was attempting to land when it crashed, killing Cynthia and Daniel McKenna of Boring, Oregon. The FAA and NTSB are now investigating. Well, before we check, uh, check in on our weather forecast today with Chris McGinnis, or pardon me, I believe it's Joseph Ranieri waiting in the wings. Joe, your turn is coming, but we really quickly want to show pictures from what is the first of many polar plunge events that are happening all around the state the next several weeks to benefit Special Olympics Oregon. So this one happened in the chilly waters of Coffinberry Lake at Fort Stevens State Park near Astoria. There are two more polar plunges set for this coming Saturday in Salem and Bend, and a big one is scheduled for February 26th at Willamette Park in South Portland. So Joe, I was talking to Chris McGinnis earlier this morning about this. Uh, not exactly frozen conditions or freezing weather conditions this weekend down there at the coast, but no. that water is still going to hurt when you walk into it. <laughs> yeah, it's still going to need, you know, a wetsuit kind of water. Now, you've done the, the polar plunges yeah. in the past, right, Drew? Yes. Uh, not comfortable, but for a good cause. <laughs> but that, that's, all, that's what the big point is. It's for a good cause. And if you are going to be out about it all today, we're seeing our conditions really improve. We saw some heavier showers arrive late in the weekend last night and kind of dried out a little bit. We'll still see some spotty showers out there on your Monday afternoon, but we'll see a little bit more of that sunshine as well. We are looking at overcast skies as we look toward northeast Portland. Temperatures are in the mid 40s, and we've been seeing some passing showers here the last couple of hours, but for the most part, we're going to kind of dial 
things down a little bit in terms of precipitation. But if you're traveling over the mountain passes, yeah, you're going to be seeing a couple of inches of new snow up at uh, Timberline Lodge. The last 24 hours, you've seen about four inches of new snow and yeah, expect to see uh, drier weather by the middle part of this week. But as we look at the weather headlines, a cooler afternoon with a few more showers. Our temperatures will be basically right on track later on today. Snow level drops down to 1500 feet tonight. Don't expect to see any accumulation. We will have the cold air in place, but there's just not going to be much leftover precipitation uh, to really see much stick around and showers tomorrow. But with drier conditions basically starting midweek and beyond, that means we start another stretch of sunny and dry conditions. I'll talk more about that in your detailed forecast. All right, Joe, we'll have more from you coming up here in a few minutes, but right now we want to get back to some local headlines, including this story. Portland's Bureau of Transportation is going to start removing parking spaces around the city that they say are too close to intersections, making it hard for drivers to spot oncoming traffic. Peabot says it's going to start with 350 intersections that don't have a stop sign or a traffic signal. They call this process daylighting. The city is going to remove parking spaces that are within 20 feet of these targeted intersections. All right, another traffic story here. The St. John's Bridge will be closed to cars from 10 p.m. until 5 a.m. now through Saturday morning because of bridge maintenance and inspections. Pedestrians and bicyclists will still be allowed to use the bridge during those hours. Flaggers will be there to help them cross. And there is one more exception to this closure. The last two TriMet buses at 1010 and 1018 p.m. will also be allowed to cross the bridge. Portland Public School Board members say they will not be relocating Harriet Tubman Middle School to any existing schools in North Portland. Previously, PPS announced plans to move Tubman after the state approved plans to widen I-5 as part of the Rose Quarter Improvement Project. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Elementary was being considered as a possible relocation site, but just two weeks ago, hundreds of parents and students rallied outside the school to convince PPS to rule it out as a relocation option. It's unclear what properties the district is now considering. Well, you may have heard about remdesivir a little while back. After months of research, doctors found it effective in fighting against COVID in hospital settings. But now the FDA has approved it for outpatient use. So as Tim Gordon reports this afternoon, this is definitely welcome news that also comes with some big challenges. Omicron carries on and COVID patients are pushing hospitals to near capacity. So remdesivir is a drug that uh, acts to um, slow down the virus once it gets in the body. So FDA approval of the antiviral drug remdesivir as an outpatient treatment is welcome news. Everything that we can do to try to keep people out of hospitals right now is, is very important because that is, I think, the most constrained part of our healthcare system um, right now is, is hospital beds and uh, availability in ICUs and ventilators. Dr. Richard Mularski is a pulmonary and critical care physician and a health research investigator at Kaiser Permanente Northwest. He says the importance of remdesivir is magnified right now because all but one monoclonal antibody treatment has not worked to fight the Omicron variant. Dr. Mularski has seen remdesivir work to slow the virus in hospital patients. Now they are identifying the best candidates for outpatient treatment with the drug. Those are patients with suppressed or compromised immune systems. Then the challenge is getting them into a three-day run of IV treatment within a week of showing COVID symptoms for an antiviral drug that is in short supply. They have to be given in a observed setting and so they take healthcare resources and those are quite limited. So everyone's struggling both with availability of drugs and with being able to get you know, drugs into people's arms. A challenge of timing and resources in an overloaded healthcare system. Tim Gordon, KGW News.